UFC Denver betting and DraftKings show. We have 11 fights this weekend. I'm John Kelly. Let's hear the picks. And we're going to kick things off in the middleweight division as Andre Petrosky takes on Josh Frem. This fight is currently a pick em, and I do favor the Petrosky side, which makes me a little bit uneasy considering he's coming off of the infamous knock yourself out by running into your opponent's hip. In his last fight against Jacob Malkoon, he had a good round one. I believe I bet him in that spot as a pretty sizable underdog. And then, sure enough, knocks himself out with uh, with a little hip bump to the head. So, uh, really confusing there. He's definitely known to be kind of a quitter. We know the durability is untrustworthy at this point. We know the cardio is untrustworthy as well. And quick thing to note is that we are fighting at elevation. We're in Denver, Colorado this weekend. So, it'll be interesting to see how the elevation affects certain fighters' gas tanks. And Petrosky is certainly one of those fighters we want to keep an eye on. Now, that being said... That's basically the only advantage that I would give to a guy like Josh Fremd is the cardio department. Because on the feet, I think I favor the power of Petrosky. I favor the wrestling of Petrosky. He comes from a Division One wrestling background, averages over four takedowns per 15 minutes, whereas Fremd only wrestled in high school and was not a very good high school wrestler. And you see that in some of his fights. Like, Against guys that don't know how to wrestle and grapple, yeah, he can mix in the takedowns and have a little bit of an advantage there. But once he faces the fighters that are legit good wrestlers or just more physical and athletic than him, it's pretty easy to see that he can kind of get ragdolled in some of those situations. And that's kind of what I expect here. And even on the feet, like Josh Frem, despite the cardio advantage, there were times where I thought he could have put his foot on the gas a lot better. That Cedric Dumas fight comes to mind. You know, sure, he won as an underdog. I bet him in that spot. But I feel like he could have like separated a little bit more. Like even on the feet, when Dumas is gassed, like he's really not putting it on him all that much. And this is just a spot where I could easily envision Petrosky landing takedowns and just kind of lay and praying for at least the first two rounds, then just don't get finished in the third. I also think Petrosky has some sneaky submission upside as well. So I'm going to slightly favor Petrosky. I know he's untrustworthy. I'm going to have exposure to both sides on DraftKings, but the official pick is going to be Petrosky by submission. Which brings us to our next matchup in the women's flyweight division as Luana Santos is now a minus 380 favorite. The comeback on Maria Agapova is plus 300. And Santos has seen some significant line movement in her favor this week. And I get it to a degree, but I also think that this is a pretty big number to cover for WMMA. Now, the reason why I think she's probably fine and still gets her hand raised here is because of the grappling advantage. We know, based on Agapova's last two fights, her defensive grappling is a clear leak in her game. She was taken down by Marina Moroz, controlled for the majority there, and again by Jillian Robertson, who we know is a dangerous submission grappler, who ended up finishing the fight on the mat as well. But I just don't think Agapova, you know, her takedown defense is okay, but once you get her down, she doesn't have much of a get-up game, and I think she could potentially get submitted as well. So certainly the grappling is going to be in favor of Luana Santos. She's somebody that has leaned on that grappling, more so on the regional scene, but we've seen it at times at the UFC level as well. Now, the concern that I have with Santos is, you know, she recently posted a photo where she got, like, pretty out of shape, relatively speaking, which was kind of bizarre to see from a professional fighter. So that's a little bit concerning there. And again, the fight is at altitude, so we'll see what she looks like at weigh-ins. Another concern on the other side is the Agapova side. We know that she's had issues um, with her training situation in the past, being kicked out of multiple gyms, uh, don't really know where the head's out. She's posted some kind of concerning stuff um, on multiple social media channels as well. So there, there's definitely uh, question marks kind of on both sides. So it's one that I think I'm going to stay away from. But because of that grappling angle, I do expect Santos to be able to land takedowns and get her hand raised here. We're going Santos by decision. That's the official pick. And next fight up, we have Montel Jackson, a minus 142 favorite. The comeback on Demond Blackshear is plus 120. Now, if you are a Fight Numbers betting subscriber, then you were able to get Demond Blackshear before the line move here at a much better number. And I do favor the underdog in this spot. I just think he has the skill set that can give a guy like Montel Jackson problems. We know based on his previous fights, Jackson really struggles with guys that are just relentlessly aggressive with the grappling. You know, you saw it in the Brett Johns fight, the Ricky Simon fight as well. Like anybody that's gonna 
repeatedly forced takedowns and grappling exchanges, I think can give him fits. Even the JP Buys fight, of course, he hurt him a bunch there and, and largely won that fight. But Buys even had a little bit of, of grappling success as well. Like, DeMond Blackshear is a very good grappler. He averages over two takedowns per 15 minutes. He's coming off a fight that he arguably should have won against Mario Batista, who's a very impressive prospect. I thought that was a super competitive fight. A lot of people scored it for him as well. And Montel Jackson, you know, he's coming off a sizable layoff. We know the training situation. You know, there were... People in the past that said, like, he doesn't take training seriously, blah, 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 however much stock you want to put into that. But again, this is just going to be one of those times where I know the the skill set that gives him issues. And I think DeMond Blackshear has that skill set. So I'm going to side with the dog here. I think he can implement multiple takedowns here and potentially even threaten with submissions. But we're going to go DeMond Blackshear by decision. That's the official pick. Next fight up in the women's flyweight division, which seems to be a popular plant your flag fight this week across MMA Twitter, which is always fun, especially when it's WMMA. Of course, you got to get in there and plant your flag. Um, I'm going to plant mine on the new coming prospect here in Fatima Klein. I'm very excited to see her UFC debut. And I think she could have multiple advantages here against the older Jasmine Jasuda Vicious. And I think a lot of people are just, you know, oversimplifying the matchup by saying, well, Jasmine, you know, the fight's short notice for Klein. Jasmine's bigger. Um, you know, she's up a weight class. Jasmine's just going to bully her with her size, blah, blah, blah. I, I really think that's oversimplification here because for... For starters, we'll start on the Klein side. You know, what does she have that that makes her so exciting? A lot of people saw that opener, steamed her to a favorite. There's been some buyback on Jasmine. Why are people so excited about Fatina McCline? Well, I'll tell you. For starters, she's the double champ over at CFFC, which we know is a promotion that usually translate fairly well to UFC success in terms of the regional um, promotions that fighters come out of. Um, now, some of those fights, uh, not super competitive, but she has fought, you know, okay competition. Relatively speaking, she fought the current LFA champion, comes from an Olympic judo background and trains at American Top Team. Uh, she beat her, uh, largely out grappled her as well in that fight, and then she really just dominated both of the title fights as well. Obviously, the competition uh, wasn't super stiff in those spots, but I think the skill set is, is going to prove to be there for Fatima Klein. She trains with Aaron Blanchfield. She's the girlfriend of Aaron Blanchfield, and she's got a very similar style. But honestly, I think her style is going to translate even better because not only does she have the BJJ grappling, hold a, holds a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, does a ton of Jiu-Jitsu tournaments, um, but she also is is a good wrestler. Like she's an actual wrestler. And you look at it in, in her fights, the way she's implementing the takedowns, powerful double legs. And on the feet, her striking is honestly pretty solid. And the last thing that I'll say about Klein is the cardio. I, I don't think it's just good. I think it's elite because you, you look at her fights whether it's the first round or the third round, it looks exactly the same because her cardio does not drop off whatsoever. I think people, you know, talking about, you, you know, she's short notice elevation. She's going to gas out. I think there there is zero evidence to support that on tape. Her cardio has looked absolutely excellent. Um, and, and even some of those regional fights, you know, you listen to the announcers and they're like, man, she's not even breathing hard. And she's setting a huge pace for 15 minutes and, and her, she's not even breathing hard. That's the type of cardio that she has. I do not expect her to gas here. I actually think she has better cardio than Jasmine. She also has the youth advantage here. Jasmine, 35 years old, Klein over 10 years younger. Uh, I just think Klein has multiple advantages here. You know, Jasmine is not a good boxer. She's very hittable. And yes, she's been good in the UFC, but a lot of those times she really just has to have her fight to win. And her fight is where she's going to eat some shots, just relentlessly move forward, try to bully you into the clinch where she's going to span those knees or try to peel you to the ground. If she can't do either of those things, then she absolutely starts to struggle. We saw that in the Natalia Silva fight. Obviously, Silva is a super prospect. I'm not saying Klein is there, but... I think a similar game plan from Klein where she just tries to avoid those clinch scenarios, stay on the outside, keep moving and outstrike Jasmine is absolutely in play. I also don't think Jasmine is going to have all that much grappling success here because Klein, I think, is the better wrestler despite the size and I think has the better submission grappling. I don't think that's up for debate either. So this is going to be one where I think a lot of people are going to take the experience um, and the UFC pedigree uh, and kind of overweight that. To, to a degree against somebody that's younger, that I think is a better striker, better wrestler, better grappler, and has better cardio. So give me the young gun. I know it's a steep 
test for her here. Jasmine's certainly the best fighter she's ever fought. Short notice, at elevation, but again, I'm going to side with the young kid here to get it done. We're going Klein by decision. That's the official pick. Next fight up in the flyweight division, we have Joshua Van, a minus 205 favorite with the comeback on Charles Johnson at plus 170. And this one, it's kind of funny. We were talking the fight numbers discord. Um, my guy Pirate MMA mentioned, uh, you know, these guys like to give away round ones. And I'm like, yeah, for sure. And so just curiously, I looked it up just to confirm that. And Van has dropped every single first round that he's fought in the UFC. He's had three fights. He lost the first round in all three of those, despite being 3-0 and in the UFC. He generally starts slow, builds into his fights before he starts to put on a pace. On the flip side, Charles Johnson very similarly likes to give away that first round. He's had eight UFC fights. He's lost the first round in seven of those. And the only one that he won was when he knocked out Jimmy Flick in the first round. So these are both guys that generally start slow and then try to work their way back into the fight. So this just screams like it's going to be a competitive decision to me. Both guys also kind of struggle defensively with the grappling in terms of giving up takedowns, but they're both pretty solid at working back up to their feet. I definitely give Johnson that advantage, but I don't expect either guy to grapple here. I think we have a competitive kickboxing match and one that may even come down to being a split decision. It's going to be a pass for me though in terms of DraftKings because I just think up and down there's better fights to target on this card. We're going Joshua Van by split decision. That's the official pick. Next fight up, we have Abdul Razak Al Hassan, a minus 166 favorite. The comeback on Cody Brundage is plus 140. And this is going to be a fight that you want exposure to on DraftKings. I think either guy can win by early finish. And I actually expect this fight to end inside the first round because on one hand, we have Al Hassan, who's a very powerful one dimensional striker. All 12 of his career wins have come by knockout. We know he has that big, big power, but he's so one dimensional in that if that early knockout doesn't materialize, he definitely starts to fade, doesn't have good cardio. Again, this fight is at elevation. And we know he struggles in terms of the defensive grappling. He's coming off a submission loss to my guy, Joe Pfeiffer, his last time out. And on the flip side, Cody Brundage is certainly not somebody you want to put much faith in because he's generally been known to look for a way out as well. We know he can be hurt on the feet. We know he fights with poor fight IQ, trying to jump that guillotine every five seconds, which you certainly don't love to see. But honestly, in this spot, I don't think that's completely, you know, drawing dead here. I think he has potential potential to hurt Al Hassan on the feet as well. He has potential to pull that guillotine and potentially out grapple Al Hassan, especially if the fight gets out of that first round, even though I don't trust his cardio either. So it's one where there's red flags on both sides. I'm going to slightly favor the underdog and Cody Brundage, but I'm going to have exposure to both sides on DraftKings. The official pick is going to be Cody Brundage by submission. And kicking off the main card in the featherweight division, we have Christian Rodriguez, a minus 205 favorite with Julian Arosa, Juicy J on the comeback at plus 170. And we'll start on the Christian Rodriguez side. This dude was just built to derail hype trains because now he's got three bodies, three notches in his belt with the Cameron Simon fight, the Raul Rosas Jr. fight, and of course his last time out against Isaac Dolgarian as well. So this guy is just built very well-rounded. He's built for tough, as they like to say. Uh, very difficult to finish, very difficult to hurt on the feet. He's got good counter-striking, and while he can give up takedowns, his defensive grappling is rock solid. He will work back to his feet. He will fight off submissions, and on the flip side, Juicy J, I think he could have some advantages here. You know, he certainly has more UFC experience. We know he's game. He's looking to get in there and brawl, and he's a tricky submission grappler as well. Now, the problem with Arosa is the glaring durability issue because he's been knocked out seven times in his career. We know the chin is absolute dust. Now the question comes down to whether or not C-Rod actually has enough power in his hands to hurt Erosa. I don't think it's going to take that much power to hurt Erosa at this stage in his career. Um, but outside of a knockout, I do expect Erosa to be competitive here. So it's going to be one, I think you want to hedge it on DraftKings and, and target both sides. But actually, I could see myself just kind of leaning in to the variance and being overweight to the underdog here, uh, despite the fact that I do expect him to probably get knocked out here. So we're going Rodriguez by TKO, but I actually slightly prefer the underdog due to the price on DraftKings. And next fight up, we have Gabriel Bompim, a minus 340 favorite, the second biggest betting favorite on the card with Angel Lusa on the comeback of plus 270. And this one 
is is another one of those fights where it's like if the underdog can stay alive after that first round, then he's certainly uh, going to be competitive in this spot. This is another potential live betting target. Of course, you can use the uh, live odd screen at fightnumbers.com, which updates during the event to tell you where you can get the best price for those live bets that you want to get in during the events. I think this is one where if, if Luce is alive, we hope that he loses round one. And then we can get an even bigger price live to where he should have the cardio advantage. Because Bonfim, we know, has gassed out bad in the past. Most of his fights end in the first round. But the ones that don't, he definitely struggles in the cardio department. We saw Nicholas Dalby put a pace on him his last time out and get him out of there in that second round. I think Lusa has the skills to implement a similar game plan. Where I worry about Lusa is that despite him never being finished, I do think his durability is on the decline. He's coming off that weird uh, eye poke stoppage against uh, Brian Battle. I tweeted that out uh, earlier in the week on my Twitter where Battle was completely dominating that fight. Lusa gets a little eye poke, says he can't see the fight's weight waved off. Battle calls, uh, calls him a wimp, basically, and Lusa threatens to kill him. So it was definitely an interesting exchange on that one. Uh, definitely go give that a look if you haven't already. Um, but I do think this is one where it, it's pretty simple. If, if Bonfim wins, it's coming in the first round, likely by a finish. If Lusa stays alive after one, he's live to potentially finish the fight or just take over and win it on the scorecard. So I am going to look to be overweight to Lusa. But I'm not going to shy away from the bomb theme exposure on DraftKings either because that ceiling is there, even though he is the most expensive fighter on the slate. The official pick is going to be bomb him by TKO. And next fight up is potentially my favorite fight on the card because there, there's just no way that this isn't fireworks, that this isn't uh, just entertainment from the opening bell. For starters, every Drew Dober fight is super entertaining because of his fighting style, but also you got to show respect to the newcomer in, in Gene Silva, who has burst onto the scene in the UFC, literally burst on the scene barking, and he's just knocking everybody out. Yes, the, he's going to take the softball in Weston Wilson, but the Charles Jordan fight, you know, just a few weeks ago, where a lot of people will, weren't giving him that much credit in that fight. And he showed that the power is certainly for real. So this is one where I think it's going to be a car crash. Both of them are going to meet in the middle. Obviously, Silva, we have stepping up a weight class on short notice as well. Drew Dober currently lined as a pick -em. I think the durability is not quite as rock solid that it used to be. But in terms of the skill set, I do think he's the better striker here, the better overall fighter, and of course has the more UFC experience as well. Either guy can win by knockout, so it's going to be one that I want exposure to both sides. But I'm going to lean with my guy Drew Dober here. That left hand, I think Gene Silva hasn't felt that type of power yet in his UFC career. And I think Dober is going to give him the vet lesson here. We're going Dober by TKO. That's the official pick. Next fight up, we have a co-main event between two olds that struggle with the durability. We have Santiago Ponzinibbio. He's a minus 192 favorite. And on the flip side, we have Muslim Salikov on the comeback at plus 160. And now we'll start on Ponzinibbio. Let's talk about the bad. The bad, he's lost three of his last four fights. He's 38 years old. And he's been knocked out four times in his career. He's basically getting hurt in every single one of his recent fights. Uh, the Alex Morono fight, Morono hurt him. Um, the uh, Kevin Holland fight got hit with a spinning back fist on that one as well. Like he's getting hurt a lot in some of his recent fights. Uh, so you don't love to see that. But in general, he's a pretty solid fighter, keeps a high pace on the feet and will look to mix in the leg kicks as well. Now on the flip side, Solikov is coming off a first round knockout loss to Randy Brown, which isn't great. He's 40 years old and he's also lost three of his last four. So now that we got the negative out of the way. You know, the positive about Solikov is he is a good striker. And historically, he's been good at limiting volume coming back the other way. His defense has definitely gotten slower and, and fell off a little bit, but he's still a pretty solid fighter defensively and has shown he can mix and take downs, even though I don't really expect him to do that here. I think this one can kind of go two ways. We have two guys that don't really have a chin anymore. Their chin is going, uh, they're old. Uh, definitely concerns on both sides. But on the flip side, we do have both guys that could be solid defensively, both guys that could decide to have like a timid kind of kickboxing match. So it's like, 
I could easily see somebody getting hurt here and knocked out in the first round. But then I could also easily see this being like almost like a sparring match where neither guy wants to take a ton of risks. We see it very competitive. Neither guy's scoring very well on DraftKings. And it, and it ends up being like a gassed out decision regardless of who wins. So it's one that I think has one of the widest ranges on DraftKings. So it's not going to be one that I'm like, you know, going out of my way to get exposure to, but I'm also not like looking to fully fade it either. So it's going to be one where I'm just hoping that it kind of doesn't kill me one way or the other. I'm going to slightly lean with my guy Solikov and I'm going to say decision here. A knockout, like I said, wouldn't surprise me, but neither would a gassed out decision that just ends up being close and, and he's able to just kind of do enough and uh, wiggle his way to the judge's scorecard. So we're going Solikov by decision that's the official pick. Which brings us to our main event as Rose Namahunas, Thug Rose is a minus 218 favorite with Tracy Cortez fighting in her first main event in her career. She's on the comeback at plus 180. And this is a fun matchup. You know, we have Rose Namahunas who at times can be pretty boring uh, like the Carla Esparza fight, but at other times she can, she can deliver highlight reel knockouts, fancy submission highlights as well like she's a very good fighter despite what people want to tell you about you know the mental attitude and all that stuff which um it is sometimes a concern but it's, it's also very difficult to quantify as well so like you can't really bake that in too much uh on the feet i think she's a very good striker she should have the striking advantage here where i worry with rose is that she can give up takedowns and she can give up control time as well. And she's facing somebody in Tracy Cortez that is a good wrestler. She averages over two takedowns per 15 minutes. She's generally pretty solid with her control time if she's able to get you down flat on your back. And Cortez has also improved her boxing over the course of her career as well. We saw that highlighted in the Jasmine Jassida Vicious fight as well with her, her boxing was on point in that fight she, you know defensively she sharpened it up a little bit and offensively she's definitely starting to carry a little bit more pop in her punches and I just think this is one that because of the wrestling threat I do expect her to land multiple takedowns over the course of 25 minutes I, I think this is going to be a very competitive fight it's one where I could easily see the judges giving it to Cortez if she lands multiple takedowns makes these rounds close but I also just think more times than not, Rose Namajunas, the judges just love giving it to her. The judges love favoring uh, the one with more experience who kind of has the bigger name. Um, and I know you're not really supposed to do that, but human nature, these judges just always do stuff like that. And I just I just think that it's going to be one that's very competitive, that people are probably going to complain that it's a robbery. And it's one that that I think Rose probably ends up edging here. We're going Rose Namajunas. By decision, that's the official pick. And as always, guys, FightNumbers.com will have my DraftKings player rankings. It'll have my ownership projections as well and everything else. Check it out. It's FightNumbers.com. We have some stuff behind the paywall. We have some free content, some free tools as well, like the Fight Prop Finder. Definitely go check that out if you want to make some money this weekend. And as always, I appreciate you watching. Best of luck, and we'll see you guys next time.